welcome back to the pod. This is a podcast where we talk to the dead. Our guests are all deceased and have a great story to tell. This podcast usually takes place in many locations. Today, we are at Heaven's Gates, talking to Rolando Revy. If you are new here, please stream our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you get listen to your podcast. Last week, we talked to Kobe Bryant. Tune in to that episode to hear more behind the scenes from the greatest basketball player of all time. Some refer to him as the GOAT. This week, we are talking to someone who doesn't get their story talked about much. His story is remarkable. I am here to welcome Rolando Vivi. Hello, thank you so much for having me. God bless you. No, thank you for coming. I've never been so close to Heaven's Gates before. This is so cool. To give some background on Rolando, he died at a very young age. Like most of you listening, he was only around the age of like 14 when he passed away. Let's let Rolando take the floor now. Well, let's get started. Rolando, tell the viewers a little bit about yourself. When were you born? Where were you born? And how old are you now? Well, I grew up in a small town in Italy called San Valentino. I was born on January 7th, 1931. This means when I died, I was only 14. I was gonna say, you look so young, but you've been dead for so many years. (laughs) What moisturizer do you use? Do you have any tricks to say looking as young as you do? God granted me the choice to appear the way that I would naturally be aged or have the appearance of when I died. I chose to look the way I died and be look as youthful and young as I was because that's when I feel the most authentic myself. That's the reason I look so young. I'm sorry, I can't give you any skincare tips. That's so cool, but I bet you miss your family. Can you tell me more about them? Oh, yes. I love my family, and we have, I have a strong connection to them. Since I grew up in Italy and I'm Italian, my family is naturally really big. When I was younger, my direct family introduced me to the Lord and had a very huge impact on my faith and holy life, especially my father. When I was young, I looked up to him greatly. He instilled a religious faith in me I will never forget and I will constantly and eternally be grateful for. My father was a great singer and I followed after his footsteps in that I was greatly involved in the parish church and parish choir. My grandma also taught me how to pray on the rosary when I was at a very young age, and I'm forever grateful for that as well. That's great. I'm also Italian, so I understand what it's like coming from a big family. My great-grandma Angelina came over here from Italy, and so did my pop-pop. I love my Italian roots so much since I grew up in an Italian household. Your faith has really inspired me, especially since you had it at such a young age. So, when you were younger, what was schooling like? What are some of your favorite school memories or maybe a favorite teacher? When thinking back to school, I have a few things that come to mind. I have one teacher that I greatly remember and am internally grateful for because she really influenced me and I greatly looked up to her. Her name was Clotide Selmi. God flowed through her veins and you could tell she was living a faithful life every single step of her way. God guided her through her steps of life, and you could see that. Every day, she drew her strength from communion. She was definitely an early figure that impacted me growing up. She shaped my faith at a young age, and I looked up to her and wanted to live so freely like she did. When I was at the young age of nine, I already made the decision that I wanted to be a missionary. Every single day at Mass, I I would see the missionary, and I just wanted to be like that. That was my goal. That is how I want it to be. I wanted to start studying to be a priest. So even though it saddened my parents, they sent me away because they knew that's what I wanted to truly do. They were so proud of me the day that day I went away and got my first cassock. They were happy to guide me into the young starts of priesthood. When I first entered the school, I was overjoyed. I got to learn in a place full of boys that were similar like me and we were like-minded. Life was not perfect though. Since the war was going on, school did eventually get affected. One late night, we were raided. They took all of our food and caused us to have to be sent home. 
I walked the long three-day journey back home with a few of my friends that I met at school that lived in surrounding towns. When we were tired, we would sleep in barns, and when we were bored, we would play soccer by picking up our cassocks and kicking around a ball. Even though we were kids, we still found ways to have fun. When we would get hungry on our trips, we would stop by the new church and ask for food. Usually they were grateful and gracious to us. We were all used to sleeping on hay already, so sleeping in people's barns was not an issue for us. We were grateful we didn't have to sleep on the side of the road or stone. When I finally got home, I just went back to my old practices of going to Mass every day and spending a lot of time in the parish and with my family. Interesting. You say that you went to Mass every day? What were some of the holy acts you practiced like in your everyday life that people didn't really do around you especially at your age because I know that the pressure of being so young and having your faith can really take a toll on you yes I did go to mass every day it was something that I enjoyed and was not anything that would be second guessed that was a practice that I did every single day and couldn't wait to do every day I remember a fun story of when I was younger on Christmas, I brought a little sack filled with hay and sweet grass, the sweetest grass and the softest hay that I found from our farm. And I brought it to baby Jesus and prayed to him and said, take my sins. There's a hundred. I counted them exactly. This is my gift to you to please pure me of my sins. And a, near, a year from now, I'm going to come back and give you a hundred virtues. This little sack of hay is for baby Jesus to lay his head on because I know how hard it is to sleep on not soft hay and not the sweetest grass. Another thing that I remember doing is when I was younger, I would go out and play soccer with all of my friends and all of the people in my town. And then right when we were done playing, I would leave them to pray or leave them to the church. It's just something that I wanted to share with other people so they could build their own friendship with the Lord. My friendship with the Lord is great, and I wanted to share that with other people as well. I think it would be silly to not share something so great to other people. What made you aware that the war was really going on since you were so young? I bet it really wasn't talked about much. How did it really impact and affect you? How was the war introduced to you? Because... War isn't always the most friendly topic to talk about at, like, a dinner table. And you were so young when it happened and you had to directly be affected by it. So, how did you handle that? The war was always surrounding me. It's not something we could really ignore. I just prayed and talked to my father through it all. When I was nine, two of my uncles went off to fight the war. The people started coming over here and raiding everything. I was getting a little scared. They started disrespecting the church and the parish, and it started to slowly affect me. But I wasn't going to take off my cassock and hide my faith. They kidnapped my favorite priest and threw his cassock and ripped it apart. This started making my parents fear for my life. But I wasn't going to change what I wear and change my faith because of other people. So, I kept my uniform on this is showing me that i am signified with god and i am one with him why would i take off my uniform and show that i'm not on god's team anymore when that is just a lie i didn't care if i was putting myself at risk if it was for my father do you want to go into more depths about what happened leading up to your death on the day of my passing After a long morning, I went to my favorite place under the shade. I ate a big meal that day and just needed to take a nap. After eating lunch, I rested for a little bit, and then some partisans came up and grabbed me. The whole time I was just praying, they grabbed me and walked with me for a while until we reached a barn. Then it was kind of a blur. It was in and out of- I was in and out of consciousness and was shocked more than anything. The white men ripped off my cassock and disrespected my faith of the Lord. They pinned me to a wall, punched me, sliced me, and stabbed me. They did this all strictly based off my faith. That night, I didn't realize I was going to die the same way similar to Jesus. 
They began to play soccer with my ripped piece of cassock and play with it. They balled it up and started to use it as a ball and disrespect it right in front of me just to hurt me. That night, I was tied up and beaten. I was tired. I felt horrible, but was thinking of my friends the whole time. God had his hand on me and was watching me. God had his hand on me the whole time. On Friday, the men took me to a hole that they dug for me. I knew that this was my grave. I asked kindly to kneel down and pray for my family. When I kneeled down, I heard a loud sound ringing in my ears. A bright light appeared. Then I was in someone's arms. God's face was smiling down at me, proud. From up here, I could see my family, and I even tried to communicate to them when they needed me. How did your family handle it? Like, how did your family handle it? From their perspective, do you know how they reacted and took the information that their young child just died? And even worse, they got martyred for their faith? My dad found me, and so did my priest that was at the parish. My dad found where the men had taken me from. I didn't return home that night for dinner. My school books were thrown in a disarray. The priest and my dad went out looking for me that night. They found a paper that said, Do not contact the authorities. We took your son. After a long day, my dad finally called the authorities and went out looking for me. When they found that the men had martyred me, they were n the men were happy about it. They were proud that one less priest would walk the earth again the next morning. I have forgiven the men because they put me in a place with my father. Even though I didn't get to finish out my life on earth, I'm going to be up here forever. But my dad still had the fury running through his veins as one would if they killed their son. He wanted revenge. It took months to get a court case, but my father's anger was more than that. He wanted more than just justice in the law. Once they found my body, they had to bury me in a hole, in a little box, just to keep me pu pure and saved, since the war was still going on. After about a month from my death, they had a beautiful memorial for my body when the war finally ended. Hundreds of people showed up. I guess I really did make a large impact on a lot of people's life. Now, my mom, on the other hand, was a mess. The minute that she found out I was dead and martyred at that, she had fallen ill. When the news of my passing finally hit her, it took a large toll on her life. She soon joined me up here because losing her son was something so hard for her to handle, and God didn't want her to deal with that. My dad still had this urge of revenge for these men. He wanted to kill. Sin was washing over him, and I knew he had these thoughts. They would keep us apart eternally. I talked to him one day through a priest, told him to banish these thoughts so we could be together again. Surely he listened. It was not easy for him, but still, he managed to do so, and the strength from the Lord by his side really did help him through it. Is there anything ha that happened that was really interesting after your death? Something that was remarkable, or some may say it was a miracle? This year was supposed to be the 75th anniversary of my death, but COVID stopped it from being a really good, great celebration. The church always holds a beautiful mass and memorial, be a memorial for me. <clears throat> a few years back, though, a special woman came to this event. She was in her 50s and came to ask for forgiveness. This woman was the daughter of one of the men who had killed me that night. She hugged all of my family for forgiveness and for, for her dad's actions. At this point of her life, her dad had already passed away a few years back, and he was changed as a man. She wanted to give him closure. She wanted to give, get closure and give closure for my family and herself. She did just that, and now she has a beautiful seat up here n next to me. I can't wait to hug her and forgive her myself soon. So many great people with a story like yours were canonized as a saint or beatified. Are you? Oh yeah, my beatification. In 2013, I was beatified. On October 5th, 2013, I was beatified and nearly 20,000 people attended my beatification. 
I was watching it from right up here. I think I had the best view out of anybody. Well, thank you for joining us today on the Heaven's Gate podcast. I really appreciate you telling me your story and showing your perspective of life. Thank you so much for everyone listening, and I hope everyone enjoyed Rolando's story. Is there anything you would like to say to close off the podcast? Everyone have a blessed day. Build your own friendship with the Lord. Remember to live for God and keep praying. Have a true blessed day. Remember whose team you're on at the end of the day. I personally love your story, Rolando, and hope that more people are now aware of this and can talk about this or show this video to more people around, like, to more people. Make your story aware and make it known that showing your faith can sometimes come with bad consequences, but you are a great example of following through your faith and not changing even though you were at risk of dying and you were at the forefront of death. When you were being abused, you still kept your faith strong. And it's a good message for people to not lose faith even in the hardest moments and the hardest hardships. I really appreciate you and look up to you as a young person that died at such, that had such a tragic death and such a tragic story. I hope more people can learn from your story and remember it and start to share it and tell more people about it so you can be more known throughout the world. All right. That's it, everybody. Remember to stream the Heaven's Gate podcast every week to learn more about a person in the Heaven's Gate that you might not have known before. That you might not have known before. Stream on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you hear your podcast. Everyone, have a blessed day. And remember to live life in Jesus' footsteps. Bye, guys. Rolando Revy out. Thank you guys for watching. This isn't a real official podcast, but I hope you guys learned something today. Rolando was a great boy and had an amazing story. If you like this video, like, comment, and subscribe. If you guys want some more information about someone, let me know. I'll look into them and maybe I'll make a video about them. Thank you for watching. Bye guys.